I'm Lisa Rayula. I'm the Associate Director for Outreach and Engagement at the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, or the PRAC, uh, your host today for this, uh, this great discussion on how state and local governments are promoting transparency into the spending of federal pandemic relief money. So a little bit about the PRAC very quickly, since we are already late. We were created by Congress in March 2020 to provide independent oversight of what is now more than $5 trillion in pandemic relief spending. Uh, we count 21 federal inspectors general as our members. And our mission is twofold. We're here to protect pandemic relief from fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement, and to promote transparency, to let the public and policymakers know where the money went and then whether it reached those it was intended to help. So at the PRAC, we're focused on ensuring transparency and accountability regarding more than 400 federal pandemic relief programs. Um, as part of our transparency mission, the CARES Act required the PRAC to create a public facing website within the first 30 days of our existence to track the money. Uh, where we met that milestone and we're very proud of our website, pandemicoversight.gov. It opens up data for the public to help people understand how their tax dollars were used. Um, it also empowers the public. Uh, the average citizen can search through the data. If they see a red flag, they can blow the whistle on that to us uh, through our hotline. It's also the only place where you can find over 400 pandemic oversight reports that have been issued by the Federal Inspectors General, and we also have more than 200 uh, pandemic response reports from state and local auditors. Um, from the earliest days of the pandemic, we recognize the importance of partnering with state and local actors, as well as the Government Accountability Office, um, and we've seen our independent oversight greatly enhanced by these close partnerships. Uh, and so today, that's part of the partnership. We're really excited to welcome five panelists to this event. Um, they're going to discuss how they use data, digital tools to provide their residents with critical information as to how federal program dollars have been spent in their communities, and also how they use that data to evaluate impact. Have these programs been effective? Um, as folks on the call likely know, uh, states and localities re received unprecedented levels of federal funding through the Coronavirus Relief Fund and the CARES Act, some $150 billion fiscal recovery fund that was part of the American Rescue Plan, um, providing direct funding to uh, states, counties, cities, tribes, and territories. Um, however, prior to the release recently in uh, late May, of this year, release of SLFRF um, expenditure data, transparency into how recipients spent this money fell mainly on local and state governments. And the level of transparency and the information available has very widely by location. So today we're showcasing examples of innovative approaches that each of the people on the screen that you see here have used uh, to inform the public in their communities. Um, I'm also happy to announce today that the PRAC has released a brand new interactive dashboard featuring the SLFRF uh, expenditure data that is currently publicly available, uh, making that information even more accessible to the public. So you'll hear more about our website and get a quick tour of those dashboards later in the program um, from Andrea Lynn with the PRAC. But I encourage any state and local offices or media that hung with us and, and dialed in to please reach out to us directly. We're always happy to walk you through the data. But now, without any further ado, um, let's turn to our great panel. Um, please put questions into the Q&A feature if you have questions uh, for the panelists, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, if I could have each of you briefly introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about your role, your organization, and how your work relates to, to the topic of today's roundtable. Uh, Maria, could I start with you? Awesome, sure. So thanks, Lisa, and thanks, Prak, for the invite to today's roundtable. Super. Super excited to share the work that we've been doing around the SLFRF funding. Um, so hi, I'm Maria Filippelli. I'm the data director at the Southern Economic Advancement Project, or SEEP. SEEP as an organization works to advance policies that improve economic security, healthcare access, and environmental justice across 12 Southern states. When it comes to the pandemic relief spending, we act as an information and technical bridge between the federal policy and local implementation. In terms of transparency, our goal is to provide reliable and timely data for our partners. We're following a subset of Southern cities throughout their state and local funding allocation process. And the resource we created to share this information about funding allocations is an interactive dashboard. And then we complement that with quarterly reports and updates. Perfect, thank you so much, Maria. Could I go next to Zach? Sure. Um, 
Thanks, Lisa. Uh, my name is Zach Markovitz. I'm the Vice President and Local Practice Lead at Results for America. Thank you, Pratt, for having us here, where I help to manage and oversee all of our work with local governments at Results for America. RFA uh, works with governments at all levels to help them use data and evidence to deliver better results for residents. And believe, we believe the power in government to make substantive change those who live within um, their jurisdictional bounds um, and have last decade worked through a variety of initiatives uh, to ensure that data can be used as a public good to help solve problems faster in collaboration with local communities. Um, and openness is one key way to build trust, engagement, and equity in the community. Um, over the last few years, RFA has been really hyper-focused on budgetary concerns and opportunities, such as our, our leadership with the What Works City City Budgeting for Equity and Recovery program uh, that focused on developing uh, actual resources for cities who are working uh, to budget for equity. And, and the most recently, and related to this conversation today, both uh, the American Rescue Plan and now the bipartisan infrastructure legislation as this critical moment in which the dollars to, at least as you mentioned, like the state and local government have the power to change how governments can operate in this country. So I'm really looking forward to talking to you today about one part of this work, which has to do with a dashboard that we built in collaboration with Mathematica, um, looking at how uh, communities are spending uh, the state and local fiscal relief dollars, the SLURF dollars, on, uh, on um, data and evidence capacity building and delivering sort of a new form of government for the future. Perfect, thank you so much, Zach, for being here. Julie, can I turn to you next? Sure, thanks, Lisa. Hi, everyone, I'm Julie Demuth. I am the Assistant Director of Budget and Performance here at Pierce County. We are the second largest county in Washington state. Uh, we received 158 million in CARES Act funding in 2020, and then a, a total of about 176 million in ARPA funds. And so my team has been uh, taking the lead in administering those funds. Uh, we've also uh, take the lead in all of our transparency dashboards. So we make all of our expenditure data, allocation, budgetary data uh, available to the public. And we also use that to report out to our elected officials. So I look forward to talking to you today. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Lisa, how about over to you next? Sure, thanks. My name is Lisa Martinez Templeton and I'm Chief Economist and Data Scientist for the City and County of Denver, actually housed within the Department of Finance. And so team tapped to head up similar to Julie's group, um, just sort of the tracking and um, performance and data piece of the ARPA funding. And so we were the ones that were tasked with building out the transparency um, dashboards and letting, again, the public as well as elected officials. So from the mayor's office to city council, et cetera, um, see really where this funding was going. Thank you so much. And Nicholas, how about you? Um, Sure. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. My name is uh, Nicolas Diaz. I am the Chief Innovation and Data Officer for the City of Syracuse, and I lead the Office of Accountability, Performance, and Innovation. And uh, my team has a broad mandate, but among the things that we do is we uh, handle the data practice, the internal data practice of the city pushing different departments to be more data-driven, as well as our different performance management efforts. So when uh, we heard, uh, when, when the city was uh, gearing up to receive the SLFRF funding, which I'll just refer to as ARPA from now on, that uh, is easier to say. Um, when we were getting ready to, to, to spend the ARPA money, the uh, mayor asked, uh, my team to be in the governance group for uh, the ARPA uh, projects, uh, and we help put together the internal reporting and governance uh, mechanisms, and then develop a, a, a dashboard uh, in part because uh, we wanted to bring that transparency focus so that we can inform citizens on how the city was performing when it came to spending our uh, ARPA dollars, but also because we wanted to use uh, uh, this big transformational investment as a way to develop more rigorous uh, data-driven practices internally, um, uh, more project management standards, and, 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 and make it uh, a habit uh, that we are using metrics uh, to measure our own performance internally. Thank you, Nicholas. And I think we'll have to do a 
quick fire question at the end, whether you prefer SLFRF, FRF, or as Zach said, SLRF. Um, very curious what everybody has been using uh, locally. Um, thank you all so much. Um, so we're going to get started soon with a tour of different dashboards, different features. Um, I'll turn it uh, to lead us through that over to Andrea Lynn, that if her screen share is working, she's kind of going to ground us a little bit with what we have on pandemicoversight.gov, um, high level on the federal level, and then go around our panelists to, uh, to show uh, different ways that you've been tracking uh, pandemic relief dollars. Andrea? Hi, everyone. Um, appreciate you hanging in there with us today. Uh, my name is Andrea Lynn, and I'm a data and policy analyst on the transparency team here at the PRAC. And what that means um, on our team, we're really focused on bringing in all the pandemic funding data and putting it on our website and making it clear and easy for the public to use. Um, and, uh, you know, we, I'm sure many of you can relate, had, uh, but maybe not in this quick time frame, we had a mandate that within 30 days of being created, we had to have a website up and running. Um, and, you know, the federal government isn't known for being super speedy at uh, technology. So, it definitely was a big charge for us. We had to figure out how we were going to bring in the data, um, what users would actually need and, and want to use. And, um, you know, we have like 22 million rows of data. So we are really proud of what we've created in such a short amount of time. And we're constantly iterating on it. And today, in fact, we just launched three new dashboards um, showing the uh, SLFRF, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, and the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant. So we're constantly trying to bring in and show new data um, in a way that will be most useful for the public. So um, I'll, I'm just gonna walk through a couple of things on our site. There's a lot to dig into, but um, for the interest of time, we'll just dig into a couple of things. Um, let's see, okay. I think you all should be able to share my screen, but someone speak up if you can't. Um, so this is our homepage. Uh, we, this is, we, where we highlight sort of new newer stories, dashboards really proud of, um, some oversight reports. Uh, and as you scroll down, we also have information about sort of the most recent stories we've published, including, you know, the event we're in right now, um, relevant news stories. And then at the bottom, we have what we love, lovingly refer to as our donut. So this is a high level overview of the $5 trillion that's been spent on pandemic funding. Um, you know, it goes through the, high level categories with descriptions and um, the high level numbers. And then um, at the top we have, this is you know my where I spend most of my time, which is the data and interactive tools tab. And this is our new interactive dashboards page. We had it here before, but we've revamped it um, a couple hours ago. So we're really excited about that. And um, here are our three new dashboards clicking into the SLFRF dashboard. Um, this is data uh, we have been sort of anxiously waiting for because it's the expenditure data for how recipients are spending SLFRF money. And we got this from Treasury in May. They published it on their website, uh, but it was put in a spreadsheet, which, you know, probably the panelists on this call would all happily download and look into. But for us, we really are focused on how can the American public quickly see what's in this without having to, um, you know, do pivot tables and things like that. So this way we have, um, you can scroll over states and see these are all the recipients that reported in this period of time um, within the state, how much they received, how much they've obligated, how much they've spent. And when you click on a state, it will filter on the side. Um, and then you can also search. So I'm coming to you from Los Angeles. So you can search Los Angeles and it has to think. And then, so both the city and the county was a recipient. So to click on the city, we can see on the side how much they obligated, how much they estimated the revenue loss was, how many products they funded. And um, probably my favorite part is that you can also see how, what sort of project categories this funding fell into. So um, we can see there were 13,000 projects in this period. 3,700 of those were public health projects for $2.2 billion. And when you click on that, it will filter and show sort of the subcategories. So you can see 294 were related to vaccination. Um, so I just think that's really interesting and helps us get into the nitty gritty of how this money is being spent. Um, we're really excited to keep receiving and iterating on this data. Um, and 
I think this is probably the page that's most useful to those uh, panelists on this call and uh, attendees on this call. So we really hope you dig in there. And if there's anything you think from your jurisdictions that we should highlight on our site that where you're spending your money, please reach out. We always want to uh, share more state and local stories. So I'll stop sharing. Um, and I'm sure, you know, I want to turn it over to the panelists. I'm sure many of you have faced similar challenges in standing up transparency websites. Uh, either for your city or county government, like Julie, Lisa, Nicholas, or as part of a broader organization like uh, Zachary and Maria. Um, but despite those challenges, you know, you all have amazing websites, which is why we asked you to be here today. And um, we'd love to turn it over to you and sort of highlight one or two things, take a minute or two, um, and just highlight features you think that you're really proud of, you think the public is really useful to the public, um, things like that. So I'll start with you, Julie. All right, just hoping technology works today. Can you see my screen? No, not yet. Can you see it now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so this is our, our overall homepage, I'll call it. This is our transparency website, which we've called Open Pierce County. We launched this back in 2018. Um, so we were fortunate enough to have a, a transparency foundation in place uh, when the pandemic hit. We um, built out a bunch of data in 2020 related to our CARES Act spending. Uh, but what I'll show you today is what we have in place for our ARPA funds, our American Rescue Plan funds. Uh, so we show our overall COVID-19 expenditures, so inclusive of all relief funds that we received. And then we also focus specifically on American Rescue Plan funding, so how we've allocated it, how we've expended it to date, and then we have a program service level and impact. So essentially our performance measures for our priority programs. Uh, so if I go down to expenditures, you know, through uh, June 23rd, our financial data is updated on a weekly basis. We've expended $31 million. Uh, and then we have a couple of charts where a user can drill into the data. So these are, this shows essentially how we've allocated by program. Uh, so we've allocated four strategic areas, community response and resilience, economic stabilization and recovery, essential government services, and then our, our public health emergency response. Um, so if you click into these areas, you can then see how those funds uh, have been allocated by uh, particular programs. Um, you can also drill into how, how uh, the specific vendor or recipient of those funds. Um, you know, so for this first one, we we allocated and spent five million dollars towards acquiring a, a hotel to help address homelessness. Uh, so lots of data around our expenditures, and then we have some of our kind of input output um, performance measures. Uh, in our public health emergency response area. Most of these efforts we've completed. Our health department is a separate entity, and so they've kind of taken on the long-term uh, address to the pandemic. Um, but then for our broader programmatic areas, uh, what we try and provide is information. This is our rollback relief grant program that we had for businesses. So we expended 6.9 million on that. We show, you know, who the recipients of those funds were, um, you know, how many were minority owned businesses, women owned businesses, veteran owned businesses. Uh, and then we show it geographically. So these uh, blue areas are qualified census tracts. So we're kind of tracking, you know, how much of the funding is going to those target areas um, and then across the county. Um, so in a nutshell, that's kind of what we do for our broad uh, programmatic areas, but I know we're short on time, so I will turn it over to the next person. I think that's me. So this is Lisa. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Again, I'm with Denver. And so this is just um, our website that we have posted up and you can navigate to, we launched a specific ARPA website. Um, and on here we've got, um, this is our dashboard that details um, the funding. And so on here we've got expenditures, so that tracks with uh, sort of the federal government definitions of it. But then we also have recovery categories, which, um, you know, we sort of, this is how we 
presented this to the public and city council, et cetera. And so, um, you know, you're able to go in and filter on um, whichever feature you would like. You can then, you know, see which agency is in charge of it. Um, and then within the projects themselves, you know, we have the ability to, if you hover on it, it gives you the budget, um, what's been spent down, and then a brief description of those projects themselves. So, um, you know, this was really intended for, you know, public consumption so they could track where the funds were going. Um, starting next quarter, we will actually be launching um, a secondary portion of this, which will include those outputs that were related to those projects. So the specific um, metrics that were associated with um, what it was that they were doing. And then sort of as a longer term, um, bigger picture related to the ARPA spending is we've launched this recovery index map which really looks at longer term outcomes that would be associated with those projects. Um, and so this was trying to get up the intentionality um, that we thought of the federal funding was to really try and invest in um, sort of systemic long-term change. And so you know, within these areas in Denver, it's down to census tract layer data, but you have the ability to um, go through and see there's um, 18 different data sets underlying this that have been indexed together to create this layer. And it's you know, broadly split up into economic health and education, um, which aligns with, again, the, the major components that we're spending our ARPA funding in. And you know, ideally over time, we would expect to see hopefully better changes made um, in tracking these, these longer term outcomes. So go ahead and stop that and I will um, hand it off to the next guest. Nicholas, I think that's you. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and screen share our uh, ARPA website and dashboard. Uh, um, just two things that I wanted to highlight um, from the way that we've set up our uh, visualization is that we've really focused on trying to make the navigation um, and the visualization as intuitive as possible. Uh, for the users, trying to combine uh, giving enough information while also not making it um, uh, too onerous for uh, someone that may not be completely familiar with how all of this works. So um, we uh, here can navigate at the top through, okay, the total number of projects that have been completed or that are in progress or that are in planning phases. Um, and if you go to the next tab, you can see, okay, of the $123 million, how much of that has been budgeted and how much of that has been spent uh, with the um, underlying assumption that the more projects we, we uh, put together um, the, uh, and, and the more money we're spending and budgeting, um, the uh, quicker we're getting uh, the uh, recovery underway. Uh, you can also uh, track this down even further by uh, priority area, which we define in four uh, big uh, categories. In the case of Syracuse, economy, families, government, and infrastructure, and you can get a little bit more detail there. And uh, I also wanted to mention that this particular design, um, we went through a few iterations and we brought in our innovation designer to do some uh, user testing bringing in some potential uh, users of this information, researchers or community advocates, or just day-to-day -day citizens um, to, 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 to get feedback in real time and see how they interacted with it. I also wanted to highlight that you can go to one of the specific categories here, let's say supporting children, families and neighborhoods, um, and you, you, you'll get a much more granular view of how the projects are progressing. Um, and, and you get here, get a list of all the projects. And the other uh, point that I wanted to highlight, which is something that we've never done before, is that uh, we are reporting the outputs in real time as, or as close to real time as, as we can on how, uh, 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 on what outputs these projects are achieving. Um, so for example, uh, for homeowner support, we've identified that the main output for this project is that we wanna assist 720 households. And so far, uh, we have um, uh, actually delivered that uh, assistance to 126. 
Um, so again, uh, inserting more of a, of a, a data-driven approach to all of these projects and also uh, hoping that the, the, the public will keep us accountable in the things that we set out to achieve. Great, um, I think I am next. Uh, I've had trouble screen sharing a second ago, so I'm gonna try again and hopefully this will work. Um, but uh, Andrew just dropped it in the chat. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it is working for me right now. Um, Zach, do you want me to share it from my end? And yeah, talk through that'll it? be great. Yeah, I'll just talk through it on the top end. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, excited to talk with you about the um, Results America and uh, Mathematica dashboard, which uh, thank you for pulling that up. Um, we This takes a look at the state and local fiscal relief fund specifically in the ARP recovery plan report as you take a look at it and looks at over 200 cities, counties, states, and then a, a couple of tribal nations and, and looks at the performance reports that were released in August and will again be revised as the performance reports uh, are coming up again in the next couple of months. And what, um, you know, as I mentioned at the top of this, Results for America is all about making what works the new normal, right? And looking at how data and evidence can play a key role in the delivery of, uh, of outcomes uh, for residents in communities. And that this particular investment in state and local uh, government is a once in a lifetime opportunity to reshape the way government operating. And Treasury, as uh, we look at the guidance documents, uh, and then we'll get to the dashboard, but to set this up a little bit, the, the Treasury, when, when put forward some of the guidance documents around this work, included within those guidance documents five key provisions um, helping to articulate how these dollars can and should be spent to, to drive a sort of the new way government can be operating. So it's use of evidence and data, prioritizing evidence-based interventions, tracking outcomes through rigorous evaluations, engaging with the public and ensuring equitable recovery for residents. And so what we'll see through this dashboard that we'll put together with Mathatica is not only this first page, which if you scroll down, you can see kind of the general level of investment and planned expenditure across sort of cities, counties, states, and tribal nations. But if you scroll up above, um, uh, again, you'll see in the second tab, um, a, a breakdown in investment areas, similar to I think what we've seen in a couple of other places here. So how are, ver are these various cities, county, states, and tribal nations investing in sort of the US treasury expense categories and sort of critical notable investment categories around education or, or, um, or justice and, and public safety. Um, but if you click on the next tab here, you'll see a breakdown on um, evidence and outcomes uh, as we've articulated across those guidance. And, um, Sorry, I scrolled up a little, there you go. Um, and if you look um, at this evidence and outcomes, you'll see how uh, investment in, from each of these city, state and counties um, have uh, been articulated around clear investments or investments that the dollars have been allocated, promising investments, right? It may be have an overseen a hurdle or there's no indication of investments here. And if you scroll down below, you can see we've categorized um, various cities, counties, states, and tribal nations along sort of how they've done it. And if you, this is all interactive through a Tableau portal as an interesting way to sort of cut this data. Most important for cities, counties, states, um, which I think is really important. And this also, we did this before Treasury put all of the uh, performance reports on, um, on their website, is this takes you directly to the our performance reports. And I think that's really important. We built this around uh, staff and jurisdictional leaders in mind to make sure that as we have an understanding, you know, we want to make sure that we're solving something around housing that's directly related to the pandemic. How do I understand not only what Pierce is doing or Denver is doing, uh, but like Fort, Fort Lauderdale, what, you know, Miami, what Cambridge, et cetera. Um, and then how does that relate to what's happening in Syracuse and get a really good understanding of, of what this comprehensive spending picture is looking like across the country so I can take an understanding of what works and bring it to the next level. So I'll talk a little bit more about what we're learning from this in a second, hopefully, but um, I, this is a, hopefully a quick navigation through what's, what's in it. Awesome. Okay. So that leaves me. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to cut anybody off. This is Maria with SEAT. Um, and so here is our ARP local fund spending tracker. Uh, we wanted our, our partner organizations, our community leaders, and our um, state and, and local jurisdiction officials to be able to see information at a high level. 
So we're following a subset of Southern cities um, and we have a few filters. Folks can look at state level, city level, or um, a population um, increment because 250,000 is a big <laughs> population uh, line with the SLFRF funding. So right now we're um, filtered for Georgia because that's where I'm currently located. And for Georgia, we have information on 46 cities. And one of the things that's really important for um, for our, our conversations and to be able to have community engagement and provide input on the process is to know where in the decision process uh, governments are. So right now for the 46 cities in Georgia, 15 have not made any decisions on their funding. Eight have made decisions for all their funds and that's, that's both halves, 100% of their funding. But then most of the cities are still right in the middle. Some decisions have been made, but there's still plenty of time to provide input uh, on the remaining decisions. And then very similarly to, to all the other dashboards, we have um, decisions by category. And these align mostly with the treasury reporting categories. We did add a few more categories as we went through the data to kind of show like, because they were just sort of trending and popping as additional categories. So it's kind of like treasury reporting categories plus a few more um, where we saw, saw funds consistently being allocated. Um, and then also because there's such a focus on equity uh, with ARPA, uh, just a little bit of a binary of if there's, we could find evidence of any equity um, in the investment spending uh, or in the community outreach. So just kind of a few high level touch points to give an overview of where um, kind of these, these cities are uh, in the Southern states. Perfect, thank you everybody. Um, and I know that we'll, we have questions from the audience, so we'll uh, keep an eye on those and, and see if we answer a few of them as we go. And if not, we'll kind of break in and ask those. But, um, you know, Maria talked a little bit about funding decisions, um, how, how folks are making those. And I'm wondering if we can ask Lisa and Nicholas, this question, um, start with you two. Can you talk a little bit about your um, organization's approach to transparency? Um, whether that's strategizing how to allocate funding or collecting data from multiple departments and then ultimately displaying that information. Um, you know, where were you uh, before the pandemic um, and how did that experience kind of shape where you are now? Sure, so I'm, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, we had a little bit of a lessons learned moment. Um, my group was brought in after the um, spend down of the CRF funding. And we were asked a little bit after the fact to come in and build out a dashboard showing, you know, pretty similar to what I showed you for ARPA and, um, you know, the outcomes and the outputs that were associated with that. And coming in after the fact, after programs had already started or collecting information, et cetera, uh, made it really difficult actually, um, you know, particularly in trying to show like an overall big picture. So um, this go round, actually probably about a year ago, um, when we first learned that um, ARPA funding was going to be released, um, we launched a logic model um, right from the get-go. And so again, before we even had final rule, before we knew what needed to be collected, et cetera, even our allocations, we started having big picture meetings with agency heads, um, division leaders about, you know, what sort of was our strategic overall goal for the use of this funding. And from there, um, started to get really in alignment about what types of data we would be collecting. Um, I mean, even things as how those particular data pieces would be collected. So for instance, like if you're gonna be able to collect demographic information, this is how it should be asked. And these are the responses that should be collected. And the intention of this, right, was so that when we're looking all together at our overall impact, um, we'd really be able to roll it up and see big picture um, fairly easily. So I think for us, that was you know, the biggest help um, that's made the rollout of this thus far go um, really quite smoothly for us. Um, but yeah, it's just getting that, that larger buy-in right off the bat and being very strategic about our investments. Thanks, Lisa. Nicholas, how about you? Um, I mean, what else can I, can I add, uh, like Lisa, summarize it so well um i i, I agree 100 percent. like it's it's it, the dashboard is not something that you can you know come in after the fact 
uh, it, it's really the result of doing things right uh, from the start um, and putting in the right practices and the right muscles um, underneath. So a hundred percent agree on like, just like getting some strategic alignment first. And I can, I can perhaps go uh, under the hood and, and show you uh, how that looked like in uh, Syracuse because uh, let's see, what am I, what am I sharing right now? Um, we, 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 we had to ask before we could even think about having a dashboard, just standardizing what information we were asking each uh, 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 project to provide. And this may be like super, uh, this may seem like common sense, like every project should have a description and, a, and an owner and a project justification, but it's something that sometimes we forget to do in, in local government. We just rush to spend our, our money. So like uh, asking each department uh, that, or, or each project owner to have uh, some milestones, identify the outputs, uh, identify your data collection plan, your outcomes, uh, whether this is a project that promotes equitable outcomes, uh, whether it, it requires community engagement, use of evidence, and then we go into the budget overview. And they don't only need to fill this template, then we'd have a review meeting to make sure that all the information made sense um, and that you know your data collection plan was sufficient. Uh, and then we had to you know establish the right accountability mechanisms um, so that we would be periodically uh, reviewing with each department, are they, are they doing what they say they're, that they're doing? Are the subcontractors or are the uh, sub-recipients rather, are they uh, reporting on the metrics that they say that they're reporting? And actually we, we and, and this is where, you know, this is such a partnership internally, it's not just my department or, or our ARPA manager, it's, you know, the folks over at uh, research who are grant uh, managers like they started building in this reporting requirements into every single contract with the sub recipient which is so important to then hold them accountable uh, when push comes to shove thanks nicholas um, and i wanted to say that for any of our panelists i think some are able to stay um, 15 extra minutes to make up for our technical difficulties um, so we'll look to stay on uh, till 2 30 with with those that are able to do that and again thank you so much for for hanging with us um i wanted to to turn it over to zach and maria right now um you know representing uh the non-government organizations um what motivated your organizations to to produce these trackers to take on this work um how did you approach it you know what were the, the gaps that you were seeing or the resource needs thanks well um so first, I, I will actually want to say that we actually never intended to create a product, product like this. Um, you know, when ARP was being rolled out, we heard from state and county and city colleagues a, a few key things. One, um, we're exhausted. Uh, the pandemic, you know, the last 18 plus months of responding to the pandemic at the time has just, it's burnt us down. And two, we now are receiving an unprecedented amount of funding coming into our coffers, and we recognize this opportunity and the need to be strategic with these funds. Um, but you know, C number one, uh, we're spent, and so um, you know, how can we both respond to the pandemic and, and be smart decisions on that? So number three, like, what are others doing in this space, right? Especially in the number of people we spoke to, like, how are they thinking about these? Uh, one-time funds as a way to both be strategic and be building out the capacity for their cities, their counties, their states to be a better operating enterprise than they were before and not just use like a peanut butter spread, you know, where it goes everywhere or, you know, thinking about sort of like key pet projects that may or may not be successful in the long run, right? And so we had heard examples um, and anecdotes of how this was happening, but not really a good comprehensive picture of what spending was looking like across the country. So we partnered with Mathematica to start to investigate what folks were doing out there to inform how we at Results for America can help um, to, to do this, right? Where, where were the gaps, where were the challenges? And you know, as a database organization, right, we want to eat our own dog food as it were. And so we got into the research quickly and realized that this was not just something that we could print out in, you know, like a, a spreadsheet, uh, which is kind of original intention, but that, you know, given the time and attention that were and the, the pressures that were being put onto our city, county, state colleagues, uh, and this needs to get out there and be able to quickly shorten the distance between I have this dollars I want to spend and this intractable challenge that I want to address and who else out there is are trying 
really key and strategic things out there. And so, um, you know, it was about really making sure that the data that were produced in mass were able to be very quickly applied because we knew that these historic funds could have a monumental effect in the way we tackle challenges that our communities have faced for generations. Um, but we also need to know what programs work, what we're trying, what we're piloting, and, and uniting evidence with the sort of funds and building long-term capacity with the community and how can that ultimately help uh, to get there. And what's exciting is this, this that aligned with the sort of five key provisions that were in the Treasury's guidance that I articulated earlier, it, it was a really aligned with what RFA's mission was, what Mathematica is trying to do, and us coming together was really important to make sure that we can get this into, um, into colleagues like Nicholas and Andrea and Lisa, who are really doing the, the, the work on the ground and making sure their communities can be really uh, laser focused on, on what can be most effective. Thanks, Zach. Definitely um, hearing the theme of, of sharing of information, um, coming together to, to, to share what's been working. And I think especially the angle of pilot projects, when people are trying something uh, new with the funding, sharing that information, um, it can be really helpful. And I think that's why we you know, have so many folks on the, on the call today. Um, Maria, can I ask you same question, same themes over to you? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I got, I got a little weird unmute myself pop up. Um, I see has a very similar story uh, to what we just heard from Zach and results for America. So SEEP is known as a knowledge hub and an organizational connector in the South. And almost immediately after ARPA was signed, we had partners reaching out to us. So wanting clarity on the process, wanting to know what other organizations were doing and wanting to know what local governments were doing with their funds. And we heard largely from smaller jurisdictions. So we're really, um, those, those jurisdictions with populations between like 20,000 and 250,000 people, um, that's kind of where, where our sweet spot is and, and where we heard sort of the most uh, call for need um, and information sharing. So most of these jurisdictions, super excited about receiving the funds, um, but really nervous a little bit about utilizing the funds um, because they didn't have extra staff capacity to manage this big, um, funding influx. And so in this context, when there's a lot of new information and there's limited resources, learning from each other really becomes incredibly important. And that was the motivation behind our work. Um, it became apparent to see that a public facing resource, resource or resources <laughs> with consistent updates would be helpful to our partners um, and the local governments in the South. Uh, and so our approach was to invest in people. SEEP hired a few consultants to meet with our partners to reach out to those groups that had questions and to really understand their needs regarding the transparency in the funding and the funding process. And we knew that finding the data would be a big undertaking because the information needed, the information that we wanted to pull and share with folks, city budgets, community meeting notes, documentations like that are not really standardized and neither are website URLs. So to kind of talk just a bit about the, the technical approach, right? Each municipality, each jurisdiction has their own combination of how they present information. And that prohibited us from having a truly, purely technological solution like a web scraper or something like that. We also knew that many of the data reporting and transparencies at the federal level would come later in the, in the timeline for smaller jurisdictions. I think the first round of reporting really for these smaller locations with these smaller um, award amounts actually was just due at the end of April, so not even two months ago. So we wanted to make sure that community leaders knew the decision status and where funding, spending plans are sort of now and during this past year. So that way they could more easily participate in the decision-making process. And so we have some really awesome consultants. They help us. Um, they helped us set up a system to manually track, collate, and present all of these funding allocations. And so the spending tracker dashboard is designed to be updated as we go through these next few years with this pandemic relief funding. And then that way our partners are aware of funding status at almost any time. They can look at the dashboard and see that um, because we know that the timing of that information is really super important for people to know, for community leaders, community advocates to know if they want to influence the process um, of how the funds are going to be distributed. Awesome. Thanks, Maria. Um, 
so you talked, you know, I think you touched on sort of some of the issues in my next question, which is, um, you know, a lot of the labor and work that can be involved in collecting, disseminating this information. Um, and, you know, you all, a lot of you talked about having transparency websites already in place before the pandemic. So I'm curious how um, the influx of this new federal funding uh, for the pandemic response affected your existing work to require like organizational shifts, additional staffing, additional resources, or was it sort of um, business as usual? So um, I'll turn this over to Julie and Nicholas, starting with Julie. Sure. So uh, as as I mentioned, uh, we implemented our transparency website back in 2018. Uh, and so having that website in place was very fortuitous for us. Uh, we were able to react very quickly. We stood up our, our first transparency dashboard for CARES Act uh, within a week after receiving our CARES Act funding. But even having that transparency platform in place, it was it was still a huge organizational shift for us in 2020. Um, we really focused and reallocated all of our resources and efforts on allocating and expending the CARES Act funds. Um, at the time, we had very limited resources dedicated uh, specifically to our transparency efforts. I had uh, one position at the time dedicated to open data and performance management work, and then it was essentially other duties as assigned, you know, for several of us. Uh, so that year was exceedingly stressful. Uh, it was a year of working really long hours. Fortunately for us, uh, the pandemic hit in the off year of our biennial budget process. Uh, so we were able to redirect resources and shift uh, priorities. But in 2020, I guess CARES Act and the ARPA funds are very different, two different buckets for us. Uh, with the CARES Act funds, we were required to report to our county council on a weekly basis, uh, which was a lot of work. Uh, we used our transparency site to build out this weekly report um, that we provided to council. Uh, we had to update that data every week. Um, but it was it was helpful having it in place because it allowed all the information that we were reporting to council to also be available in real time to all of our constituents. Um, you know, we closely tracked expenditure and performance data. We had to uh, identify performance measures, uh, put structure in place to collect all of that data from all of our internal departments as well as external providers um, on a weekly basis, which is uh, it's a big lift. It's a lot of it's a lot of time. Uh, but our county used that information to identify uh, where process changes were needed. Um, it helped us to get the funding out into the community very quickly. Um, we understood where we needed to kind of pivot and reallocate funding uh, if there was an emerging need. Um, so it really helped us uh, just react very quickly in 2020. So with the CARES Act funding, it's of course longer term. Um, you know, so we're able to be a little bit more intentional, very strategic, uh, looking for long-term impact and outcomes rather than that emergency state that we were in with the CARES Act funds. Um, so fortunately, I think you know, 2020 was very difficult, but fast forward two years, um, our county has really invested in open data and transparency, um, as well as data analytics. Um, so I'm fortunate enough to, I now have a team of eight research and data analysts, and then a team of six budget and performance analysts. Um, so it's, uh, our county has really focused uh, and shifted to looking at data driven decisions. Um, so for us, the pandemic, you know, really helped institute that culture here. Great, thanks. And I'll turn to you and Nico, Nicholas. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, we had our existing open data portal where we publish a lot of existing data sets. But frankly, we didn't uh, have much uh, experience doing uh, budgetary or grant related reporting in the same way as ARPA um, required us to do. Um, we did have experience uh, doing data analysis and, and visualizations and different performance management uh, tools. So we leveraged some of that in putting together our dashboard. Um, and we also hired a new dedicated position, uh, an ARPA data analyst uh, to um, uh, not only build the visualizations, but also handle um, the day-to-day -day reporting requirements. Um, but I'll also mention that, as I was saying, this did take um, 
a, a big change management, like organizational change management uh, perspective as well. So I think it was really important to um, work together, not only within my, my department, but also working with the finance folks who would be keeping track of a lot of the financial spend, uh, the budget team, um, the neighborhood and business development as one of the main users of the funding, uh, our, our research team. And we also appointed a new uh, director of strategic initiatives who would be like our, our uh, uh, SAR, if we want to call it that. So I think, again, that multi-departmental collaboration in thinking about this big uh, reporting and, and accountability framework internally uh, was very important in getting this off the ground. Thanks, Nicholas. So many of you have talked about um, the CARES Act experience, lessons learned from CARES Act, but, but then came state local fiscal recovery funds, SLFRF, SLRF, we'll settle that in, in a few minutes, but in the American Rescue Plan. So given the size and the flexibility and the report, reporting requirements of the SLFRF program, were there specific challenges that you faced in reporting on those funds? Um, and Lisa, uh, can I start with you? How was how was your experience with that program um, in Colorado? Sure. So um, one of the things about Denver is we're a self-contained city and county. So we actually got both allocations. Um, and so for us, the spending really is a very large dollar amount, as well as it um, it was involvement from nearly every agency within the city. And so one of the um, issues that we encountered of it was that knew it sort of ran the gauntlet from familiarity with reporting um and like data and performance reporting so we would have some agencies that were very familiar with it you know they worked in the workforce space and they're well versed in federal reporting requirements to some agencies that worked with you know really quite niche um nonprofits that had you know, nearly zero familiarity and um weren't well versed and weren't comfortable with it and so it was really sort of helping to bridge the gap between those two spaces. And one of the things we did was, um, you know, from the get-go, we involved not only with the programmatic leads um, in sort of like agency heads of directors, but we also made sure to right off the bat loop in the data analyst leads from those various departments. So that right off the bat, they were involved. They knew what was going on. They knew what would and wouldn't be feasible in terms of data collection. And for those really smaller nonprofits, um, Denver ended up rolling out a data reporting collection hub so that um, people that weren't familiar with this, you know, they have the ability, they can just log onto a portal online and sort of report out the metrics that way and ask them very straightforward, you know, standardized questions. Again, ensuring all of this data is collected in a standardized format. But um, I think that for us was really the biggest issue is trying to just coordinate across this very broad spectrum um, of groups. Thanks, Lisa. And then Maria, how about you, especially taking a, a regional view across states? Sure. So we kind of um, can categorize our challenges in a few different buckets. And so one is technical challenges because the data and the information is in all sorts of, of formats and ways um, across different sites. It's, it's a pretty labor intensive process to collect and manage all of the information needed. And that's a, you know, a bit of an ongoing challenge, but but it's understood. I mean, that's just sort of um, something that that we know that we have to deal with as we go along with this uh, reporting and transparency. Another is timeline challenges. So the multi-year timeline to allocate ARPA and SLFRF fundings is amazing. <laughs> that That's great, right? Lots of time for community engagement and really think about things strategically. Um, but within that multi-year timeline, Every city that we're looking at has their own timeline, their own budgeting process, their own, um, you know, thoughts about how they will, when, when they will allocate the funds. So we're on this um, basically constant loop of looking at city sites. So we have our list of cities that we're following. There's about 200. And so it takes about a month. And so basically every month we start at the top, we look through all the sites, you know, we indicate it if we know when a change will be made, if not, we're kind of searching for that change. And then once we get to the end of the list, we're right back at the beginning. And so um, just you know, continuing to cycle because those timelines just sort of run the gamut within the, within the larger ARPA timeline. Um, also the information each government shares can be different. 
So <laughs> all the governments represented on this uh, on this panel have amazing amounts of detail, amazing amounts of information. That's not always the case. And so sometimes there are these fully documented lists and itemized lists of where every dollar is going. But sometimes cities just kind of have um, some high level buckets of funding or allocations identified. Uh, so we have the, you know, we just have to kind of figure out um, where you know, the best way to kind of show all of that information. And we've also come across a new challenge. Um, we've only seen a few instances of this. It's only come up very recently. But as we move from along the process or and progress timeline from allocating funds to implementation, we've heard from a few places that sometimes funds are reallocated. And so the budget's produced. It looks like everything's good to go. And, you know, it, um, the allocation buckets are set, you know, it's, it's, it's clear where funding will be. And then somewhere between that and implementation, funds are getting reallocated. And so that's happening a little bit behind the scenes. And sometimes, and, you know, like I said, it's been flagged for us only a couple of times and just recently. So it's been difficult to figure out how to find that information and understand when and why these changes are happening. Thanks, Maria. That's that's a really important point and one that uh, Zach, if I can turn to you next, um, are there similar or other themes, common insights that you've seen kind of taking a look across uh, localities or, or a national look? Yeah, a, a lot of really exciting themes and trends that we have seen um, through this data uh, and um, so one, I'll just say like, you know, as for, for like sort of larger trends on issues, you, you can go to the dashboard and, and sort of sort and code um, to spot some direct trends around, you know, justice and crime or health or et cetera. But, you know, one thing that we're able to do is can't take a step back and look at the data overall. And so a couple of things I hope to maybe bring to you all with an, a caveat I'll put on this, that this is all data from August of 2021, right? We'll be refreshing this in the next couple of months as the new performance reports come in, but it's important and interesting to look at this as it is right now. So a few things, one is around government modernization. You see uh, jurisdictions across the country are using these funds to grow their fundamental capacity to use data and evidence in the daily delivery of services. So um, you'll see Detroit, for example, is spending some of their ARP dollars to build a citywide data warehouse that will help to maintain their data and importantly integrate systems across the city, right, focused on pandemic response because it'll have that immediate impact to measure and track outcomes there, but we'll have this kind of long-term implications for governing because so many departments at that point will be able to kind of get information faster, do quicker analysis of budget and resources, and redirect funds to more effective programs. Also around this space, we're seeing that governments that had previous before ARP had built data evidence capacity for decision-making as measured through our work city certification or state standard of excellence had seemed to be creating stronger and higher potential uh, ARP spending plans. And so what this means is that we're seeing evidence that investment in building the capacity of local jurisdictions to use data effectively is actually an important prerequisite for this kinds of opportunities. So it's never too late. We can use these funds in this direction, but it's an exciting and important trend I would just want to say. So two um, has to do with kind of government innovation. Um, you have about 40% of jurisdictions that are piloting new programs um, and the flexibility of the state and local fiscal relief funds um, is leading to a dramatic increase, I think, in innovations um, and new programming, um, which are really with um, important uh, critical components on this. And, and I can go through a number of different examples uh, of, of how that is. And sort of the challenge I'll, I'll note that along, this goes alongside the piloting um, is that there, you know, fewer than half, you know, about 44% are actually planning on investing in evaluation. So, you know, I think as we look at the future of what works, I'll, you know, pairing this exciting proliferation of new pilot programs with sort of a, a, a little bit of a dearth in evaluation, right, we want to make sure that we're we're evaluating how these programs are working so that when these dollars go away, um, the we have a really good and exciting new uh, catalog of what has been seen to work through the sort of these new federal dollars so that we can spend the sort of general operating support on what has been shown to work more effectively. Um, and I'll note that, you know, what's important on this piloting is that we expect the 
that there's actually more conversations, uh, more pilots that are happening out there. But given where the reporting was required in August, that you should consider these numbers as a floor and not a ceiling, right? We have a number of jurisdictions that publicly announced all the exciting things they were going to do. But when they reported to Treasury, you know, it, there was a relatively blank piece of paper or something that was really nominal because of so many sort of, you know, conditions there. So treat that, that the data that's in there as um, sort of a floor. Two other quick trends, and then I'll, I'll turn the mic over uh, back. One is we see communities are really pairing um, data with community input to drive equitable investment. So you see almost three quarters of jurisdictions are engaging with residents on how to spend their recovery funds and, and about the same amount focused on equity. Um, you know, uh, uh, King uh, County, you know, right, right next to, to Julie there um, has a... Uh, a is using you know an equity uh, impact review tool in Washington, right? And strategic plan and equity dashboard to ensure its investments are, are leading to equitable outcomes for residents. And you see a number of communities that are trying to innovate around how they bring community members into a conversation to advance equity. And then last, and one thing I'm really seeing that's exciting, and I mentioned this before, but jurisdictions are learning from each other, um, and that you're there was a purpose of this tool, and we're seeing this having seen Maria nodding as well. Like, I think this is exciting to see, right? You see like Durham, North Carolina is adop adopting an equity scoring matrix for there that was created in Pueblo, Colorado, right? You have Springfield that was inspired by Toledo's ARP spending rollout. And it's replicating the parts that make sense for their community, but borrowing from other jurisdictions that are doing really exciting, innovative work. And now I'll note again that, you know, we're gonna be updating this in the next few months. So keep an eye on that. I think we'll see so much more of what the borrowing and sharing and replicating can look like. And that's something that I think we'll continue to track, report out on and help jurisdictions with over the next number of years as these dollars are being spent. Um, awesome, thanks Zach. And it's really exciting to hear you touch on governments working together and learning from each other because that sort of was the motivation for this event, um, especially, you know, selfishly for us, it's just we want to learn from all of you and um, see what amazing things you're doing. And we hope that, you know, we can continue to do events like this in the future because it's just, it's rare. And, you know, there are certain um, areas where governments get together, but it's not always at different levels and other organizations. So we're really excited. Um, and I think you touched on this a bit, but, um, you know, a lot of people brought up different challenges with SLF or SLFRF reporting and um, changing requirements and things like that. So, you know, given what we know now, I'm curious, um, what recommendations would you all give the federal government if, um, you know, we had to roll out a program like this again or something similar? Uh, and yeah, give, given what you know now, um, I'll start with you, Maria. Awesome. Uh, well, my first recommendation would be to stay with what's working. So the equity and engagement the equity in implementation as a focus for the state and local funds is fantastic. And having federal programs continue to focus on this equity and this reconciling of longstanding systemic issues is really key to maximizing the impact of federal programs. My second recommendation is around process and stressing the importance of process transparency. Even though many of the resources that we've looked at at SEEP kind of show where funds are going, most don't show how the decisions are being made about the funds or how to track implementation. So, you know, sort of, sort of next phase after just that fiscal transparency is to think about the process um, and what's important to share about um, the process for, for allocating and spending the funds. And my last recommendation is to think about ways um, to provide resources to expand capacity. So SEEP, again, we work with really small jurisdictions um, that have maybe only a few people on staff, um, really just kind of looking to leverage other resources that are out there. So a program like the state and local funding, um, it's great to reduce the barriers in receiving the funds, but then you know, for these uh, local governments that are stretched thin, it can be difficult for them to be nimble with such a big change. So providing resources even if it's something like a reporting template, or maybe there's a list of like pre-approved organizations that can help kind of pitch in and provide that additional capacity um, would be my last recommendation when you think about future federal programs. Yeah, 
Uh, the, so the biggest challenge for us has been in the administration of the funding and managing expectations, you know, the expectations of our communities, our providers, our subrecipients, our elected leaders. Um, with the CARES Act funds, we were operating under emergency orders uh, that really helped us to get the funding out the door much quicker. Um, with the American Rescue Plan funds, you know, expenditures are subject to the provisions of the uniform guidance, and so administration is just much more complex, and it takes uh, it takes a lot longer to administer. Um, as far as recommendations go, I mean, broadly, I think if if the federal government could continue to identify ways to lessen the administration burden on recipients and subrecipients, while of course still being able to ensure eligibility and proper use of funds, I mean, I know that's a big ask. I'm not sure how one can do that. Um, but, you know, some significant changes were made from the first issuance of the interim final rule to issuance of the final rule that really impacted our administrative workload, um, you know, around the changes in expenditure categories, or we had to go in and restructure our financial data um, to align with all of the new expenditure categories. So um, fewer categories of expenditures with broader uses um, could be helpful in helping to navigate the complexity. Um, and then finally, just from a technology perspective, I think there could certainly be some improvements. Uh, the portal is not particularly user-friendly. Uh, the quarterly expenditure reports and annual performance reports that we have to do are a substantial effort and they require uh, you know, manual data entry into the portal. Um, so if there are ways to improve the technology platform, I think that could certainly help streamline process and, and reduce some of the resources needed at the local level. Awesome, thank you. And um, before we move on to um, next question, I just want to see if anyone else on the panel had, I'm sure you all have a bunch of recommendations. So if there's anything that uh, you really want to get off your chest, uh, feel free to chime in. Okay, um, so moving on to our, I think our last question, just in the interest of time. Um, so we've gotten, uh, quite a bit in the weeds today about what goes into ingesting and displaying funding data. Um, but, you know, we all know that sort of data, this data is used to tell a broader story, um, which you all do in various ways on your sites. And so this is sort of a quick fire question for everyone, but what, what themes or insights have you all seen in your transparency work? And this could be across just the federal spending or federal funding or in just being transparent um, at the local government level. I can start. Um, so just just quickly, the biggest theme is that transparency is good. Uh, it helps governments and community leaders and organizations really learn from each other um, and about each other, and it it increases the accountability around the ARPA funds. Um, and so having more transparency, encouraging more transparency about things like process. Um, show how government leaders are committed to equitable investments and overcoming these systemic challenges in their community. Awesome. And can I pop over to Nicholas for one second? I know you have to drop. Unless you don't have time. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I do have to drop off uh, for a 230 hard stop, but appreciate. Uh, um, the time being here, uh, one insight, I guess, super basic, but uh, doing this right takes time. That would be my, my recommendation. And it takes a lot of conversations and it takes a lot of, you know, getting together and getting some definitions of what, what we're going to refer to certain things. Like what even is a budgeted project versus an encumbered project? Like, even though it sounds basic, um thinking about how you're defining anything your your framework that governs everything it really pays off um to have that defined early on and, and creating like a like a like a single source of knowledge as opposed to you know being six months down, later down the line and you and uh, you have six different trackers all of which show a different number of total projects and then trying to reconcile that later on Awesome. Thanks, Nicholas, and thanks for joining us today. All right. Thanks for the invitation.
Anyone else on the panel want to hop in with themes or insights? Uh, I just quickly. Oh. Go ahead. Sure. So I was going to say you know, for, for Denver, I think one of the best uses of this, um, and again, so that the data is refreshed quickly, basically about as, as quickly as we get it. And so it's just being willing to utilize this data, right? So being willing to pivot and to learn from things. And if something's not working to change, maybe go a different direction. So um, I think that's really one of the, the key takeaways for us with this, this whole exercise. Awesome, thanks. And Julie? I'll just quickly add that uh, I think how we communicate data is essential. I mean, I think communication is probably even more important than the data itself. Uh, you can put a ton of data out there and, and make it available to the public, but if it's not consumable or understandable, it really defeats the purpose. So I would just recommend, you know, investing as much on the communication, the design, uh, how the data looks, uh, invest in that as well as, you know, collecting the data and analyzing the data. Great, and last but not least, Zach. Hey, yeah, um, I've talked a lot about trends that we've seen, but just to build off what Julia just said, you know, I think you're thinking about the why uh, before you enter into a project like this. Who are your users? And then what's the purpose of putting the data out there? Um, you know, spending that time, as other folks have said, to, to think through the, the beginning to the end of a project like this, um, and then really articulating your goals before you actually start the process of collecting the data or putting together or pushing it out there. I think that will ultimately make it really nuanced. It may actually make you report less out uh, or fewer things out, but um, that what you actually do report will actually meet the need that you're trying to set out with here. Thanks everyone. Um, thank you all so much for your expertise, your time, for sharing your experience. Um, I found this to be so interesting. We've already held people over, even though I wish we had scheduled this to go even later, because uh, we, we have so many more questions. But we will look to convene another event like this, um, given the interest that we saw and, and people hanging with us through technical difficulties. We'll follow up from this webinar. Um, I know we weren't able to get to many of the questions, so we will do that offline and, and work with our panelists to do so, as well as make sure that we send links um, and resources from each of their organizations and offices. So thank you um, to Maria, to Zach, to Julie, to Lisa, to Nicholas. Uh, really appreciate all of the work that you're doing and for coming together to share what you've seen um, in your locality or across the country. Um, because as you've all highlighted, sharing, sharing those resources and information um, has been really important and key to, to helping us recover and cope through the pandemic. So thank you all so much for attending. Um, and from the PRAC, thank you. Thank you very much um, for participating. And we'll hope to see you all soon. Thank you.